Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time it is for you, wherever you are right now. And welcome to another session of Bizarre Financing. I'm Gordon Bizarre, and today we're going to dig into this thing called AI, specifically ChatGPT. And we're going to do two things at the same time, hopefully. We're going to show you how to make it very easy using AI to evaluate a company that's a target company that you would like uh, potentially to acquire. And then the other thing we're going to do today is to give you some insight of how to use ChatGPT in a way that's phenomenal and very effective. So look at today as dual use. Okay, one is about evaluating a target company and how to do it fast and basically easy. And the other is how to get the most out of ChatGPT by learning how to pose your challenge or your question or request information in a way that gets you deep results, not just surface results, but deep results. And will give you the ability to be very powerful and very effective in terms of how you're able to accomplish almost anything that requires information. And information is the key to everything today. If you have it, you're going to be successful and powerful. If you don't have information, you're just not because information is the age we live in. All right. With that as introduction, you're going to have questions today. And if you do go to that question box on the right-hand side in that panel there, type in your question, happy to answer it before the session is over, raise your hand. And if you actually want to discuss it or talk about it, I like these oral questions because it really gives everybody a chance to hear the question and, and get a better understanding, especially as we dialogue about it a little bit, peel down that onion and get underneath uh, the basic question down to sometimes the answer that really matters. And of course, if we don't answer your question today, just email us question at bizarrefinancing.com. We're happy to answer it for you. All right. With that, by the way of uh, introduction, I've also created a handout for you, which if you go over to the panel on the right side, you'll see a, a box there where it says handouts. And in there is a duplicate of the document that I'm going to be going over today, because that document is going to become the key to how you extract all of the information that you want, ways to handle that information on the company that you're looking at. You're going to have a marvelous tool at the end of this webinar to be extraordinarily proficient at evaluating a company. All right. Now you'll notice at the top here, it says template for evaluating a company for sale using chat GPT. So that's a nice heading for it. Now you know exactly what this is. And then the next item here is something that says instructions, copy and paste everything below the line, following these instructions. And before the instructions near the end of this template into the chat box and attach the PDF copy of the CM supplied to you by the business broker. Okay. Now, in case you're not exactly sure what that means, if you were to pull up chat GPT, this is what you're looking at. And over here, this is all the questions I've been asking it. And it creates a separate session for each one of these. And then down the box here in the bottom, there's this little dialogue box here. It says message chat GPT. So this is where you paste the things in here that I'm going to be giving you. Here's where you communicate with chat GPT. And you'll notice there's this little paper clip right here which means if you want to upload something to ChatGPT for it to evaluate for you, it can be a PDF, it can be a graphic, it can be a Word doc, whatever the kind of document it is, you just click this and it'll ask you something like this, upload from computer. So you click that, then you just will go to the file that you want to upload and within seconds, right, it's uploaded. Okay, so when you hear me say, attach a document, that's what I'm referring to is you type in here, you cut and paste in here, but if you have a document, you do that through the paper clip right there. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. All right, now, this is what you have a template of, okay? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take these instructions and follow them here. So everything you see here, and it's a long document, so you're going to copy, and I'm just gonna, you've done this a thousand times, so what this does, you just keep doing it all the way to this line right here, where it says end of cut and paste. And you don't do the line, but you take everything that you'll have highlighted, you copy it and then you paste it into that chat box on chat GPT. All right. And then when you do that, you will then, I'm going through this in detail because some of you maybe haven't used chat GPT. So when you do that, there's this little button over here. That's like a send button. So once you have it copied in there, all you're going to have to do is click the send button. And now chat GP is going to go to work following the instructions that you gave. It. All right. So here's the instructions. Okay. So here's what's going into chat GPT. It's everything from this line all the way through to that line at the bottom that I gave you. Let's go over what you've just asked of chat. I have received, and by the way, the one that's the part about chat GPT is you literally just talk to it like it's a person, okay? Just think of it as another person. Think of it as a person with a PhD capable of understanding any question you're going to put in there 
and coming up with a formidable answer based on the, on the quality of the question that you asked. So when I say you're going to learn a little bit about using AI today, what you're going to see is how detailed we are about what we ask ChatGPT to do. The better you ask your question, the more detailed your question, the more the better composed your question, although it will uncompose it no matter how badly you've composed it. But the clearer you can make your question, the clearer you're going to get your answer. Okay. So here's how we do this. We want ChatGPT to analyze what's called a confidential information memorandum. And we receive that from the business broker who wants to sell us the company. If the company doesn't have a broker, the owner may have uh, put together some, the equivalent of a CIM. And it'll be that document that you're going to do this with. But whatever that document is, that's the document we're going to attach to this request. So right now we're just copying and pasting. And what's going to get pasted in there is your conversation with ChatGPT. You're saying to ChatGPT, I have received a company's confidential information memorandum, CIM, from a business broker and need to decide if I want to pursue a purchase. Please evaluate the company for sale using the attached CIM. In your evaluation, address the following questions. If any of the questions are not answered in the CIM, please indicate that so I can follow up with the broker. Okay? So that's the specificity of what you're asking ChatGPI to do. All right. So you have typed this whole thing in. You attached the CIM, which it will now read. It will read that entire CIM. It doesn't matter if it's a PDF file, uh, a Word file. doesn't matter what it is. It ChatGPT is able to read it. And it's even if it has graphics in it, it'll read the graphic. It'll know the graphic. It'll understand what the graphic is illustrating. So here is what we've told it to do. Here's the information that follows our request. Okay, questions. Company information. So what do we want to know about the company? We want this question asked first because when we get the printout, we want to be able to look at the top and know which company this is. You may be doing this for a number of different companies. So what is the company's name? Right now, that'll answer will be right at the top. What is the primary product or service offered? What is the company's principal address? Okay, so that'll be right at the top of the printout that we're going to get from ChatGPT, those answers. All right, then company operations. Provide a brief description of the company. It will, having read that whole CIM, it will understand this company, what it does, how it works, all of that in financial information. It'll, it'll have all of that ready to prepare these answers for you. So it will take all of that and boil it down into a brief description of the company that tells you succinctly and clearly, what is this company, what does it do? What does, where does the company have physical locations? So they may have three locations. They may be in different cities, whatever it is. If that's in the CIM, it'll tell you that here. What is the geographical scope of operations and sales? What only does business in Denver or it does business anywhere in the Western United States or it does business all over the country or internationally. It'll tell you what the scope of the business is in terms of its reach. What percentage of the market does the company hold for its products and services? ChatGPT will go into the internet. I try and identify what that marketplace is, how big that marketplace is that this company services. Try to get an idea from all that data that's out there, and it'll find it if it's out there. And then compare that to the date, to the amount of business it's, that your CIM says this company does. And then it'll tell you what share of its market it has. That's an important question. Because if it only does a relatively small portion of its market, then it's got a lot of room for growth. If it does 90%, of the business in its marketplace, there's no room for growth there, at least not in that marketplace. So these are the things that are starting to give you key information about the company. How old is the company? Is this a 10 year old company, a 50 year old company? Was it formed yesterday? And the guy just uh, formed it, wants to sell it. People are crazy out there. You want to know what the age of the company is. It'll give you an idea of how long it's been around. If it's an old company, the chances are it's got a lot of outdated processes in it. If it's a fairly young company, the chances are that they've been uh, better at uh, adapting modern technology as a way of keeping their information in their systems. What are the company's SIC and N codes? Even if they don't give you these in the CIM, because this, because uh, chat GPT knows what the business of the company is, because it read the CIM, it will go and identify which standard industrial classification code or which North American um, industry code system what code it is for NAICS. So between these two numbers, you've made any further research on the company very easy because now you can tap into information about the industry that the company is a part of. So it'll know that even if it wasn't put into the CIM, 
what are the industry trends affecting this company? That may or may not be discussed in this, in the, in the CIM. Sometimes the broker, if they write a good CIM and the industry is growing in leaps and bounds, they'll have some statistics in there relative to the industry and its growth and all of that. But not every broker is uh, that good that they do that. So when you ask this question, if it can't find it in the CIM, it'll go out onto the internet and go find what the trends are in the industry. So now you're going to have a better chance of knowing, is this business part of a growing industry or isn't it? Okay. Does this company have a future because the industry itself is growing? So you're going to know that when you finish this process. What are the company's key performance indicators? It may not say anything about this in directly in the, in the uh, CIM. ChatGPT knows what a KPI is. They know how to take the numbers that are in the CIM that discuss the uh, number of uh, units they might be selling, the amount of dollars that they may be selling, and it will identify certain key performance indicators that are applicable to that company and then tell you what they are. So now you'll have a sense of not only what are key KPI indicators, but performance indicators, but what ones apply to this company. What are the main operational challenges the company faces? Okay. They may discuss this directly in the CIM, but a lot of times they don't. An honest uh, CIM would say, these are the industry challenges and here's what the company does to overcome them. A bad CIM doesn't tell you that. So if that's not in there, then ChatGPT will go out into the marketplace and identify industry-wide what are the operational challenges for this type of company, given the current economic conditions and et cetera. Okay. What is the company's approach to innovation and, te and technology adoption? Okay, so in the CIM, it may say, this company has the latest technology, but it, it, it has this software system, now they're up to date. And if it doesn't say anything about that, the chances are pretty good. It'll tell you they didn't say anything about that. It'll tell you we didn't get an answer to that. And then you'll know that probably this company isn't really tuned in to the latest technology, or they probably would have said something about it if it's an important part of the company. All right, so this will give you, start to give you a pretty good profile of company operations. Then you get down in here for the next thing that's important for you to know, which is ownership details. All right. So first question here, how many owners are there? Do you want to know, is this company owned by one person? Is it owned by two brothers? Is it owned by three people? Is it owned by another company? In other words, who, how many owners are these and what are their names? And if they're people, how old are they? All right. Why do you want to know that? Do you want to isolate that information? Because if they're 50, their motivations are going to be very different than if they're 75. Okay. And your whole approach to the owner is to a large extent going to be, is going to be adapted to their age and what their motivations to sell are. How urgent is it for them to sell? What needs do they have that you can construct or structure your deal to satisfy for that particular seller? And as you start to learn this information here about the, the company, you're in better and better position to sculpture and structure your deal so that the owner is going to get what's really important to them. What are the responsibility, what are the roles and responsibilities of each owner? And this is important for you to know because you want to know who's key to this company, who's doing the important functions, who's responsible for sales, who's responsible for production, who is it that does the quality control and make sure that the product that are, it turns out are quality products. So you want to know all the different areas that the owners are responsible for, because if you have to replace the owner you want to know you can do that by what they do. If the company's owner doesn't do it and it has other people, that's something that you want to know. They can do it. You don't have to do it because I got other people to do it. So what are the roles and responsibilities of each owner? And then the next key question is, are the owners willing to stay on and run the company? And if so, for how long? A lot of times it'll say in the CIM, the owner's willing to stay on for six months and transition to the new owner. Okay. So that owner's gone, which means the goodwill of the business, if he's a key person, is gone. Because when they leave, all the goodwill goes out the door unless you step in and can replace it. But then it's you that's replacing the goodwill. Why are you paying for the goodwill if you're the one who has to go in there and replace it? Okay. So are the owners willing to stay on and run the company? I like to see, see that they're willing to stay on for at least three to five years and continue the process. Deals work best when the owner stays on for a long period of time and continues to run the company, leaving you free to go out and do other business, go buy more companies. And then over a long period of time, three to five years, Take the time to find a great replacement or groom the replacement from other key individuals in, within the company. What are the reasons for selling the company? This tells you a, a myriad of things about it. And a lot of times it'll be in the, because it's a key question that buyers ask. So many times it will be in the CIM. What are the reasons for selling the company? Now, the first question you might ask is if all this stuff is in the CIM, then what difference does it make if I ask all these questions? All I got to do is go read the CIM. Yes and no. Okay. And the reason to know is it's Organized, every CIM is organized different. The information is in a different place. It's said in a different way. It's in a different type size. It's hidden in a bunch of other information 
that's over here and someplace else. The beauty of this is you got ChatGPT digesting the whole CIM and now putting the information right where you know exactly where it is. So as you know what's on our template, you know right where to go for that particular question and that particular answer. So it takes a disorganized, non-uniform bunch of CIMs and it organizes it and puts all the information in a place where you can, you can identify it and get to it easily and quickly. Okay. Do the owners prefer a partial or complete sale? Sometimes you'll see in the CIM, the, on, the owner wants to sell 10%. The owner wants to sell 50%. The owner wants to sell 80% and retain 20%. You'll see all that in there. Now you know where to find that. Once you've done this, you know where to find that information right here on the output that'll come out from ChatGPT. Are the sellers open to seller financing? It is so for how much? A lot of times that will be in the CIM, buried somewhere in there. The seller's open to seller financing and he's willing to take 40% seller financing or 60% seller financing. If I'm just sitting here going through a lot of CIMs, man, this is doing a lot of work for me and putting information in front of me where I can go, this one's no good. This one's not for me. This one isn't got the right answers. This one, well, here's one that has all the right answers. And as I'm going through it, I can make decisions very quickly without having to read a bunch of disorganized CIMs with information all over the place in no uniform format. Okay. So now, okay, we continue on here. Okay. Are the sellers open for a rollback investment? In other words, here, they're willing to take a note for, this, for, for a part of the purchase price. But here, are the sellers open for rollback? That means they're willing to take the money they get from the close and invest a portion of it back in your buying company, back in your SBE that's buying their company, your special purpose entity. Why is that important? Because if, it's, if there's an answer there, I know I've got a pretty sophisticated seller. They, they know something about selling your business and how to make it attractive to a buyer. But what's more, if they're willing to do a rollback investment in my buying company, guess what that does for me as a buyer? It lets me, by knowing how to set up the proper escrow structure, show that there is not a loan to the, to the seller or from the seller. There's an investment from the seller, which guess what? That money that he rolled back into an investment is going to show as equity investment in the company. And if I know how to structure it, which I do, that's going to look to the lenders and everybody else as if I am putting up the investment money. So that's going to end forever. To the, what's your skin in the game, All right? Because there is going to be an equity investment in the buying company, which is going to increase the amount of leverage that you can use. It's going to increase the amount of loan money you can get by virtue of an equity investment in the buying company. So these are all important questions that can tell you very quickly the benefits of this that are available to you through this company. Now, these answers aren't always in the CIM, and you're going to see how we handle that in a moment. But if you can get the answers to these questions and put your fingertips on these answers really quickly, you become a much more powerful business buyer. All right. Then there's financial performance of the company. It was things that we want to know. What are the company's rev uh, sales revenue, net profit, and EBITDA? Now, net profit and EBITDA are different. Net profit, you can make lots of net profit and have a negative EBITDA. And the reason you can have that is you've got a lot of accounts receivable. Okay. And if you don't collect them and they get to be 120 days old, your EBITDA is very low. You got lots of net profit, but you got the taxable income coming in, but you're not getting the cash. The cash isn't flowing through the company. EBITDA is the most important number on there in reality, because yes, you want to make profit, but if it doesn't translate into a strong, positive cash flow, then it may not be a company that you want to buy because you're not going to have enough cash flow to amortize the debt that you incurred to pay, the to pay for the company. So you want to know these numbers and it's going to go understand where they are in that CIM and it's going to put them right here for you on your printout. Now, what is the year over year growth rate in revenue, net profit, and EBITDA? Year over year growth rate is one of the two most important numbers that you will see. And, and you want it extracted and put right here where you can see it. And the reason it's important is because the multiple of EBITDA that you affix to the company as a valuation, how much is the company worth, is much different if it's got a very slow, minuscule year over year growth versus it's growing like a weed. Every year it's, it's 30, 50, 70% more than it was the year before. And the reason is if you're growing that fast, then it's entitled to a higher EBITDA because the company is very quickly going to pay for itself. If you are, have a very slow growth, then the company isn't going to pay for itself very quickly because it's not growing with enough future profits to pay off all that debt that you borrow. So the thing that makes a company worth more is not just the EBITDA, but the growth rate attributable to that EBITDA year after year. So when you know that, you know whether you're going to be able to put a high value of, an, of a multiple on the company of EBITDA versus a low multiple, what is the EBITDA as a percentage of 
revenue year by year. All right. Uh, we, we're buying companies now where the uh, gross profit in the company is like 90% and the EBIT is 80%. Their cost of goods or cost of services are so low relative to the value that they create that there's huge margins in some company. I want to buy huge margin companies all day long because any little thing changes, it's not going to affect the profit us that much. Whereas if I'm working on a three or 5% net profit margin and one of my costs or one of my expenses increases and I don't catch it right away to, to infuse it back into new pricing, then I can lose a whole lot of money before I even know it. So we like to look for companies with a very high percentage of the revenue is EBITDA and where it has very high margins. What is the last year of financial data provided in the CIM? A lot of times it's the middle of 20 and we'll see that the CIM as the last revenue figures they gave us are the year end 2023. This is a volatile world. That was six months ago. We need to know what these numbers are now. So that's telling me before I can make any kind of an authoritative offer on the company, I've got to have their current financials that bring me right up to date last month or right up to the, 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 the last day of last month. And I need to have them before I can really commit, even in an LOI, which is non-binding, to any form of pricing or valuation on the company. The next one, is there an explanation for the absence of more current financial information? A lot of times they don't say that in the CIM, but the reason we have it here is because when you see what happens after we do the printout that we're working on right now, we're going to have a second printout that we ask it to do, which is to take all of our unanswered questions that it couldn't find answers for and print out a list of those questions so that we can ask the broker or ask the seller. And we'll have a list, a compiled list so that we can supplement what it finds in the CIM with the right questions to go back and ask the broker and the seller. What's with this? Okay, so nothing is going to fall between the cracks when we're finished with this. Is there, okay, what has, what has limited the company's growth rate up to now? Like I said, a lot of times we're going to find those answers in there. You're going to see there was, there was COVID. And with COVID, we lost half our sales. And then as COVID uh, decreased, we gained them all back again. And now we're growing like a wheat. All right, so that kind of stuff will be in there. And it gives you a, a rationale for how the company it got to be what it is and what challenges that may or may not present for you. Continuing on, how did COVID-19 affect the company's earnings? Compare the impact of COVID-19 on the company relative to the industry. The CIM is probably not going to have any industry information, but ChatGPT is happy to go online and check a whole bunch of statistical websites and find out what has happened in that industry. And if the company did poorly going into and coming out of COVID, but the industry didn't do that bad towards in COVID rather, and now it's doing very well. That's telling you a little bit about how this company is managed and operating. You want to know that. What were the reasons for any downturns or up in revenue or EBITDA? A lot of times you'll be looking through financial statements, either in the CIM or not in the CIM, and you'll notice this radical changes year to year in revenue or profit. This gets underneath that question. If there's evidence there, it'll find it. If it's not there, you'll find it in the questions that you're going to ask the, the seller. Does the company, excuse me, have audited financial statements? Probably not if it's a small to even a mid-sized company. But if they have audited statements, you want to know that because it's going to make it a whole lot easier to get your financing for the company. Okay, consistency check. Consistency check. Is the business owner consistent? I'm sorry, is the business overview consistent with the financial data disclosed in the CIM? And what's going to happen here is the chat GPT is going to go into analyst mode and it's going to say, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense in sales, given what's happened to the supply chain. So if the supply chain was impaired for this period of time and the sales are up dramatically, that makes no sense. So we will construct a question to ask the seller, what happened here? Why did this happen? How does it happen? Are the graphics consistent with the data? So they may have graphics in there that show significant growth, but then the data that people have to actually dig into and, and mathematically understand doesn't back that up. So they're looking at the, at the graphic and they're saying, oh, this looks beautiful, but they get into the data and it doesn't look so beautiful. ChatGPT can read the graphic and see if it's inconsistent with the data that gets into it at a deeper level and identify any discrepancies. So all that's going to happen here. Okay. Competitive advantage. Read the company description. This is your instruction to ChatGPT. Read the company uh, description and identify their competitors, including the website URLs. So now it's knowing what this company does, because it read the CIM, it's going to go onto the internet and identify its competitors and what their websites are. And so now, if you want, you can now later on, because you'll know who the competitors are and who, what their website is, 
you can go into those competitors and dig down on them and find out how good they are compared to this company you're buying and what chance your company has in that competitive world out there. What is the company's unique selling proposition? Okay. If they've got one, usually they're proud enough about it as to why they're different, how they get their customers that nobody else can compete with. They'll tell you that in the CIM and you want to know what it is. What is the company's competitive advantage? Is it the competitive advantage? They've really got low costs structure relative to their competitors. Okay. What's their competitive advantage in the marketplace? Can you start to see how, as you're learning all this information and having it put at your fingertips that you're getting pretty knowledgeable about this company. And remember, you haven't spent two seconds yet to read the CIM. You've got your hard work and PhD chat GPT doing all this heavy lifting for you. So what is the company's competitive advantage? Okay. Now having all that information, valuation in terms of purchase. Okay. It's going to tell you in the CIM, what is the asking price? Boom. Here it is. You don't have to go find it. You know exactly where the purchase price is or the asking price. What does the asking price translate to as a multiple of EBITDA? You're going to know, are they asking three times EBITDA, five times EBITDA, 10 times EBITDA, 20 times EBITDA for the company? You're going to know. It's going to be right there. How long has the company been on the market for sale? It makes a big difference. This company has been for sale since 19, it's been on the market 20, 24 years or 25 years, which is a little ridiculous, but sometimes it's going to be three years, five years on the market versus 60 days, right? Now, the reason you want to know that is because if the company's been on the market a very long period of time, chances are that by now, if it's been a really long time, that seller is going to start to become flexible in terms of the price and terms they're going to want for their company. What are the sources of revenue? So here they'll give you the product lines, the service lines. And then if they have graphs or anything within the CIM, you'll know what products they're selling the most of and uh, what's, what services or whatever are producing the revenue. Is there a concentration of significant revenue from a few customers? They probably aren't going to get into that level of detail in the CIM. So what will happen is this question will pop up again as something to ask the broker or the seller so that you can get an idea if there's concentration, like 20 or 30% of their business comes from one customer. That's not a good thing because if you lose that customer, you're out of business. On the other hand, if no more than 5% of their comes from any one customer, then that level of, con of lack of concentration is important because now you've got relatively stable income. No one loss of no one or two clients or customers are going to hurt you. Same thing is true of suppliers, by the way. Excuse me, we want to get into that as well. Are the sellers willing to consider seller financing? If so, how much? Now, that's a little bit of a duplication of a question that we asked earlier. It's just we're getting a little more refined here. Are the sellers willing to consider an earnout? An earnout means that you give them a certain price, which is relatively low for the company, relative to that demand that the seller is making for a much higher price that they want. And an earnout is a way you can give the seller their higher price for the company because in order to qualify for the higher price, they have, to, they have to build earnings in the company that justify it. So if the seller is saying to you, listen, this company's worth five times what we're saying it's worth. And they say, it's only worth that if it achieves a certain amount of income. So if you want to do this, we'll do it with you on an earn out where if you believe you can get the company because you're going to run it up to that level of earnings, then we'll pay you that price. And then we'll have these markers, the income markers, let's say quarterly or annually, whatever you, you agree with. Where if you hit this earnout level, then we pay you this much more money for the company. So that way, if they don't hit the earnout markers, then they're not getting paid for it. If they hit the earnout markers, then they were right. The company is worth more than it was when you looked at it before it built in this higher growth opportunity. So it lets you know if you can get on the same plane with the seller of showing him a way that he can get more money for the company. How did the sellers determine the asking price? Sometimes that will not be in the CIM, but it's if. It, it may be a question. I want to make sure I'm asking the broker or the, or the, or the owner, because I may go back to them with my business price calculator, right? I show them exactly how this company gets valued in the marketplace, but they're saying, no, it's worth twice that or three times that. And then you ask them this question of how did you determine the asking price? And then you get back, John, my friend sold his company for that many times even. Huh? So mine must be worth that. In fact, my company's better than his, so it must be worth more. Or they'll say something like, well, that's the amount of money I need to retire. If I can't get that for the company, I can't retire. So that's what I got to get. All of that is not a, a justification for an asking price because the marketplace won't pay him what's good for him. It'll only pay him what the market price is. And that's what you got to get to. And so you've got to bring out onto the table the fact that the selling price is not justified. And this helps you do that. Okay. We're trying to understand this companies, And so we have our trusty PhD reading the uh, CIM and pulling out all this data for us. So we want to know something about the customer base. What is the customer retention rate? In other words, they sell, they sell a guy today. How long is he with the company, right? Are they with the company for six months, 
a uh, one-time purchase ever. Clients uh, hang in there and work with us for an average of three to five years. And what percentage of our, cu- uh, of our uh, customers cancel or, or drop out in any given year? What is the customer acquisition cost? How much does it cost us to get a new customer? Here's what we spent on advertising, marketing, but if it's in the, the CIM, good old chat GPT will find it, go pull it out. But if it doesn't find it, you can't pull it out. It's going to be on our list of questions to ask the seller. Are there any significant customer contracts that are up for renewal soon? Okay. If it's not in the CIM, we want to know that. So we're going to have to ask the seller that question because, and it'll be part of our due diligence to check and make sure that there are no big contracts that are ending soon. That once that contract ends, all that beautiful income that's been supporting for the last year or two or three, this is gone and there's nothing there to replace it. Legal and regulatory. Okay. Are there any pending legal issues or lawsuits against the company? A lot of times if a company has lawsuits or pending lawsuits, they just won't say anything about it. But if they don't have any, they're very proud of that. And in the CIM will be something along the lines of the company is, has product liability insurance and it has errors of omission insurance and it's got all these insurances and the company has no litigation or has, it, it's not in any litigation and there's no litigation pending. So they will tell you that because they're proud of it. But if it doesn't say anything, then you got to go ask the seller. Are there any regulatory ish, any regulatory changes expected that could impact the company? A lot of times the company becomes from sale because the owner has been in the industry for years and he's been following the local, uh, the local uh, politicians and they're pushing for a certain kind of redistricting. And what's going to happen is his district, his area is going to get residential only instead of being commercial. So it's going to hurt his business. And there may be something that he has to do something in order to either stay there or move. And that's the reason he's selling the company. So we want to fish all that stuff out. And here's where that process starts. Human resources, how many employees does the company have? That'll probably be in the CIM. So you want to know, is this a a three company employee with a high income that they outsource everything? So they have high income, but no employees, or is there a a number of employees that are committed and work directly for the company and the company is able to sustain that ongoing payroll? Are there any key employees critical to the company's operation and what are their plans post sale? Probably will not be in the CIM, but it will then appear on the question list of the things that we want to ask the seller and the owner. Supply chain, who are the company's main suppliers? Are there any supply chain risks or dependencies? Same concept here. Intellectual property, companies that have patents, that have a strong brand identification and trademarks. Are there certain intellectual property that gives a company more more value? Maybe they've uh, produced uh, a certain software or they uh, have certain trade secrets that nobody knows except a handful of people and that handful of people don't share that, but that lets them make a lot more money than the average company. So what intellectual properties the company own, patents and trademarks, et cetera, are there any pending IP issues or disputes? They may have a patent, but it's in dispute. So they, maybe they don't have a patent when the dispute settles. Environmental, social, and governance. That's a kind of a big item today. What is the company's ESG policies? Are there any ESG risks or opportunities? Okay. Then 14, future prospects. What are the company's strategic goals for the next three to five years? A lot of times it's in the CIM. If it's not, you want to ask the seller. Are there any planned expansions or new product lines in the pipeline? So if, do they have any new stuff coming online? What is that? What is it? The market does it address? It's going to open up a lot of questions that we want to ask. What are the projected financials for the next few years? They gave you the history and maybe they didn't give you the history. All they gave you was the projected financials. So this thing is going to be lopsided and they're not going to have any financial information about the current stuff, about the current and past, just these beautiful projections, which frankly, that's pie in the sky. So. We want to know, are, are there projected financials and do they tie in to the ones that you've seen in the past? Is there a big gap between what they've shown you already and now what they're projecting? Overall assessment. Okay, this is my favorite question because we're asking ChatGPT, who now has read this whole thing, has digested it, fully understands everything it's telling it. Okay. And then we're saying with all that wisdom that is built into the AI system, all that knowledge, which it is now captured about the company. Okay, we're going we're gonna to ask that chat GPT with the PhD, what stands out about the company, both good and bad, that I should know about? And that's the catch-all question. Whatever we, we weren't smart enough to ask, whatever we didn't know about that specific business, our brilliant artificial intelligence is going to come up and it will probably go into a paragraph two or three with 10 or 15 different items that we didn't ask because this company has certain unique factors and, and aspects to it. So that will be a beautiful question that will, again, give us uh, insights into what other questions we need to ask uh, the seller or the broker. Okay. Then the last thing it says here, this is an instruction to ChatGPT, is a follow-up request to what we just requested up here. 
and that is for each of the above questions where no answer or relevant information was found in the CIM, please, and by the way, you'll see us use please in there. You think, why are we using please? We're talking to a machine. Interestingly enough, the statistics say that the algorithms that they put into this artificial intelligence likes to know we're appreciative. And when we say please and thank you, they tell me you'll get a better, deeper, more qualitative report. Okay. For each of the above questions where no answer or relevant information was found in the CIM, please print out a list of the, these questions for me to ask the broker and or the owner. So now I'm going to get another printout, not only answering all of those questions to the best of the AI's uh, ability or relative to what's in the CIM, but now whatever is missing, we're now going to have a complete list of questions to ask the broker and the seller so that nothing is going to escape our investigation of this company. Now, there's no other process that I know of that you can use that's going to empower you to understand and know about this company than the process I just shared with you. Okay, so here is the end of your copy and paste. So it was between the two lines. Remember, we had a line at the top. We have a line at the bottom. So everything between just gets copied, put into the, into the chat box on ChatGPT. You press the send button, you're done. You sit there and you watch it print across the screen. It'll take anywhere from three or four minutes to do the full printout. It'll start printing immediately. So it, it knows instantaneously the answers to all those questions. So it'll start printing, but it's only printing can go so fast right across your screen. And then when it's done, you hit the copy thing at the bottom of chat GPT. You see where that is here. Okay. Across the bottom here, there will be, when it finishes putting everything on your screen over here on the left-hand side, you'll see something where you'll see something that says copy right here. There's a number of other things you'll see. You click that, it copies it, and now you just paste that on a Word document. And now you've got a Word document that you can work with, that you can cut and paste from that, that you can manipulate any way you want. And that will be the complete set of answers to the two things. One is the answers to all your questions that were able to be deduced from the CIM. And then the other uh, part of the printout will be every question in order that you're going to want to ask the seller. So you're going to sound like a genius when you talk to the, the broker or the seller. You're going to sound like you understand this company better than anyone else that they've spoken to. There'll be nobody who is prepared and informed as well as you, none. And that goes a long way, frankly, in giving the, convincing the seller that you have the credibility to buy this company because you understand it. None of the other folks who she talked to had any concept of the things that you're asking and discussing with that seller. So you've already positioned yourself with credibility beyond anyone else that seller or broker is, is speaking with. Okay, now here is the last piece of instructions that I would be giving you today, and that is modification instructions. Not every broker is going to give you a CIM. Some of them are going to have a, an executive summary that they give you. Some of them are going to have a business plan that they give you. There's going to have something they call a prospectus. Okay, and so all you do is in the words where it says here, memor either the words confidential information memorandum or CIM, you do a find and replace. Find this, the confidential information memorandum, memorandum and replace with executive summary, replace with business plan, replace with prospectus or whatever it is that they gave you. Okay. But now the document is now tailored to the particular document that they actually gave you. So this is the, the tool. It's incredibly powerful. It puts AI at its current highest level to give you the answers. It takes in not only everything from the CIM and then organizes it where you now know where that information is. You don't have to go digging and finding it. And it also positions you to where that information is now checked against information on the net to see its credibility, to see what, how things match up with the outside world, how the company matches up with its competitors. All that stuff is now coming together for you. And you didn't lift a finger. You lifted a finger, but that's about it. You took a CIM PDF file that the broker sent you. You uploaded it to ChatGPT. You copy and paste on this particular tool that we just gave you. You put that into the chat box, you hit the send button, and that's it. Now, everything is in your hands, organized in a way that you can effectively use it to evaluate the company. And I want to tell you, what we just put in your hands here has saved you, I would say, at the very minimum, eight to 10 hours of digging through all the stuff, trying to organize the information so it makes sense to you, figuring out the right questions to get at the bottom of the different things that are a challenge within the framework of the CIM or business plan or prospectus or whatever it is that they've called this thing. And you now have it all at your hands and you didn't have to think about it. You didn't have to damage a brain cell. Everything is now there for you. Now, do you still have work to do? Sure. Now you've got to understand it yourself. 
but it's organized in a way that you know where all the information is and you don't have to figure out what to ask the seller. You know what to ask the seller to fill in all the blanks. So that's the tool, ladies and gentlemen, and hopefully this has been helpful to you today. All right. Any questions? Any questions? Yep. I got one. Oh, I got bunches. Oh, that's good. Is that the seller is willing to stay on after the transition? Should you pay the seller a consulting fee and should it be paid on a day to day basis? Uh, there's lots of pay the seller. Okay. You can do that. You can pay them on a, not a day to day basis for that. You can do anything. Anything's doable. The way I like to do it though, is if they want, I like it when they stay on and run the company. Why? Cause I'm never going to hire anybody who can run it like they do. They know that thing inside and out and I'm going to build in a a bonus system or a, a, I'm trying to think of the right words, a system where they benefit from running it really well. And that way I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to have them. I don't have to manage it myself. The best acquisitions that have run successfully after the acquisition have been companies where I had the seller stay on for three to five years. It's the best. And yes, they get paid. Yes, they get bonused. If I've left them owning 10 or 20% 20 of the company, that it becomes their bon their bonus. They still get paid for their hourly work, so to speak, but now they're going to share in the growth of the company. And from my standpoint, I'm going to brainstorm with them knowing the company and me understanding business. I'm going to brainstorm with them things that they can use to grow the company bigger, better, faster than they would without the information I'm able to share with them, allowing them to earn bigger bonuses, allowing them to earn uh, a great return from the percentage of the company that they still own, allowing the percentage they still own to be worth a whole lot more in three to five years than it would be. And where I'm thrilled to death to buy that 20% of the company from them in, in three to five years, because I'm going to leverage the company we've built together in order to buy them out. So it's going to be a, a win for everybody. Everybody's going to win. Do you, uh, samples, I'm not catching one word here, sample CIM, you can, oh, you have a sample CIM you can share with us to test the robot. <laughs> the more disorganized, the better. <laughs> okay. Suffice it to say, we've already done that through many of these, but the reason I can't share CIMs with you is you only get them after you sign an NDA with the broker. So once you sign that, that you can't share that with anybody because that would be violating your non, your non, your non, <laughs> I'm doing a Biden here. Uh, I can't remember the name of the thing. Non-disclosure agreement. Thank you. All right. So there you go. So no, I don't have any, but the very first one you get, do this because you'll be amazed at how it works. Do you find that chat GPT fabricates, fabricates misleading answers? Do you find yourself frequently fact-checking the answers? We always fact-check the answers just because we've never used it prior to our first using it, right? So of course we want to know if it's got, if it's getting the answers. And the answer is, if you ask ChatGP to go out into the environment and find stuff, sometimes it, it's like any brain, it will have a loose wire someplace and it'll come back and it'll give you some inappropriate information. But the questions that are finite, it's, this is, here's the, the CIM, here's the question. Specifically, I want to know this about that. And it's all right there for them to analyze it. We have not found any, any wrong <clears throat> or misleading answers. The only misleading answers we found are when it goes out into the big, wide, wonderful world out there and uh, it does comparisons with industries and whatever, because it may or may not find the right place to find that answer. It thinks it did, but it didn't. Okay. So it's not perfect, but it's still going to be a long way from trying to do this on your own. All right, next is the chat GPT you're using, the premium or free version. It's the one you pay $20 a month for. It's the best $20 buy on planet earth. Okay. It's faster. You get in immediately when chat GPT is busy and everybody else is sitting there getting a blank screen because it's, there, there's too much, they're having too many growth pains. They can't really accommodate everybody that want, wants to use chat GPT. Spend the 20 bucks, unless you are flat ass broke, spend the 20 bucks because it will be, it, it will, it will move you along much faster. I don't have any evidence that it thinks any better, but it's clear it does it faster. And it's also clear that I get in when I have colleagues that don't have the paid version and they're not getting in. All right. One of the common sources of data for market multiple is the financial information of publicly traded companies. Is the same or similar industry as the target company. Okay. I, I probably misread that some way, but it's probably just stating that's one of the common places you find industry information. Public company data is readily available from various sources, such as financial websites, databases, reports, filings, or where to go, where would you find financial information for privately held companies? It's a little tougher. There are paid data sources that I go to, and I feed the answers that I get from those paid data sources into ChatGPT because it won't go into paid data sources. 
And if I, so that's the one thing I will do on my own. Now, there's another aspect to this as well. There's a big difference between chat GPT and what's the, the other one? Gemini. Okay. And Gemini will give you answers all the time. Well, that's private. We can't tell you. Chat GPT doesn't do that. All the stuff that I get when I go in to get information that a lot of the times Gemini is telling me it's private information. We can't get that. Chat GPT just gives it to me. And I, I've done it enough that I know that I'm wasting my time right now using Gemini. Now, maybe not, might not, that might not be true a month from now because these guys are competitive and they're always looking at each other, I'm sure, and they're going to want to outdo each other. But as of today, I get much better results from Chat GPT for these kinds of questions. And that's why I use Chat GPT here. Okay, if the target company's CEO owner has active litigation against him personally or the company is cited as a plaintiff only to help, to help determine that the CEO's true income net worth is, is it worth pursuing the target company and what approach should be taken to make a deal with the owner? Okay, I'm going to read through a little bit of the question here because I probably didn't say it exactly right when I read it here. Bottom line is there are databases, paid databases that will give you all of the background information on the company, lawsuits, everything, regulatory violations, everything. One of the best ones is the one attorneys use. So what I do, if I'm serious about a company. I call up my attorney and I tell him, look, I got this company. Here's the information on it. Give me a background check on the company. And because I have a good relationship with them, they'll do that for me. Now you got to have a good relationship with an attorney to get that. And if they don't like to do it, they certainly don't do it as a general rule because there's even potentially rules against them sharing that information with anyone. So what I do is I take my attorney and in my case, I put him on an advisory board in my company. So now when he gets that information, puts it in his own file in my company. And as the CEO, I have access to all the files in my company. So he, there's, a, there's ways around, at least the rigid way, way around the rigid rule by softening the rule. Okay, so there's ways to do that. But there are limits to what ChatGPT can do for you when it, gets to, when it gets competitive with paid databases. Because they know if they start giving the information that the paid databases are that's their livelihood, they potentially are going to be in for lawsuits in the future. So at least for now, they're pretty much skirting around that. But I do take the, the when ChatGPT can't find something, they'll usually say, can't find this, consult this database. And it'll tell me about a paid database where I can get that information. So if I need that information bad enough, I'll do a one-time fee or something like that with that database to get it. Or if it's something I would use a lot, I'll get some, I'll get their least expensive, most limited subscription to it so that I at least can get that key information. Has ChatT ever given you an inaccurate assessment? Well, I have to say yes, but that was almost a year ago. And the ChatGPT has come a long way since then. Since in the stuff I'm doing regularly, I, I can't say that I find anything with a gross misrepresentation or grossly inaccurate, but let's put it this way. This is not my due diligence when I buy the company that I'm going to do the real due diligence, okay? And there, I'm going to have my attorney do the search for the legal, any legal issues in the company. So my accountant's going to dig into the numbers and see what's going on. They'll, I'll, I may even have do a, what's called a quality of earnings report, which is going to be a team of accountants that have access to every software on the planet who will go in and, and, I, and truly research the industry, its trends, where it's going, what the product of the company is, how competitive it is, what's the concentration of sales, concentration of supply. They'll go into the company and do all that. Now, by the time that's done, I may be out 20 or 30 grand, but if I'm buying a, a five or 10 or $20 million company, uh, that gets lost in the noise when we put together all of the costs, if you will, of doing these things. So this is not meant to be your final due diligence. This is meant to give you the information so that you don't go spend weeks or months working on this deal only to find out it's not the kind of company you thought it was. Okay. That's what this is for. And then once you pass this threshold, you'll be able to take this information and go out and line up your lenders, line up your investors, do all that kind of thing where their commitment to you will be based on final due diligence. But now they'll talk to you because you have something that's preliminary that with your letter of intent and this kind of a check on who they are and what they do, there'll be enough credibility there that they're willing to give you a commitment pending their acceptance of true due diligence. So hopefully that helps put it into perspective. This is a tool that lets you take 30 or 40 CIMs because you got to kiss a lot of frogs before you find your prince, as uh, Cinderella said. If you're going to want to find your prince and you got a lot of frogs out there, this will get you past all the frogs really quickly and the prince will shine out. Okay. And that's what you're looking for. All right. My GPT answer stopped after question two. That's probably because you don't have the expensive one. 
a, if you get the $20 version and you use four, it's called four point little tiny zero now, I don't get that answer anymore. Okay. And if it does, by the way, there's a little where the, where the button was that you press to send it, you, a little different kind of button comes up and you press it again and what it'll go, it, what, what it's saying to itself is, oh, I hiccuped. All right. So it'll, it'll go back in and redo it for you. And you'll notice at the bottom, almost every time there's this little thing that says one or one of one. Okay. And then if you do that, then there'll be a, a two of two. So the second one it does usually will go the distance. And if it doesn't go the distance, what you type in there is you stopped at two. Okay. Give me the rest and it will do it. Okay. It's hard to believe AI uh, or artificial intelligence can get lazy, but apparently it can get glitches. Okay. It can, it, and this happens more by the way, when the system is overburdened with lots of traffic. Okay. Cause uh, it's wires are getting heated up in there. But whatever it doesn't do, just go back and say, please uh, correct this. Please redo that. And the good news about ChatGPT or any of the AIs is they don't sweat. Okay. Their muscles don't get tired. They don't go to sleep. Okay. They'll just keep redoing it and redoing it as long as you ask it. They don't get bored. They don't say, God, you asked me this five times. I'm not doing it again. That's not an answer you get from ChatGPT. So don't be afraid to say, look, you didn't give it to me. Do it again. As it say, still isn't right. You gave me too much of this and not enough of that. Do it again. Okay. Only I tell you, say, please do it again. You'll get better results. Don't forget the please and the thank you. I, since I've been using that, I find my chat GPT loves me. <laughs> it just gives me what I asked for. So don't knock it till you try it. Okay. As a beginner, how important is it to get a balance sheet? It's essential because without a balance sheet, you don't know what values are being ascribed to the assets and what assets are even included in the deal. So for example, when you write your LOI, your letter of intent, you're going to attach a PL and a balance sheet, and you're going to reference the fact that all of your offer, all of your, the offer contained in the letter of intent is based upon the attached financial statements and the values that it shows for the specific assets. Okay. So that gives you a lot of leeway and a lot of leverage, frankly, with the seller. If later on they say, oh, it doesn't include that asset. I'm taking that out. Or you see all this cash here. Well, that's not going to stay. That has to stay. Well, why does it have to stay? I sell, I said, what business are you selling? Are you selling me the assets only, or are you selling me the operating business with its goodwill value? And I'll say, I'm selling you the going business with a goodwill value. If I removed all the cash from your company, could you run this company? No, I got to meet payroll on Friday. That's right. So you can't take the cash out because if you take the cash out, it's, it's not a going business anymore. It needs working cap. So when you sell a business based on a multiple of earnings, I got to have the business when I, when I purchased it, that produced the earnings. And a business without working capital doesn't produce those earnings. It's part of the value of the business. It's why it's worth a multiple of the earnings because it has everything in it that's required to generate those earnings. If you take anything out, you're not selling me a going concern and I'm not paying you a multiple of EBITDA for it. See, that's how that works. Okay. But you always say it nicely, right? But you make the point. How much due diligence is required for a deal? Lots. <laughs> there is a Latin phrase, caveat emptor. Yeah. Buyer beware. Okay. And yeah, that's absolutely true. And you make an, you can have representations from the seller in, in the purchase agreement. You can have guarantees and warranties from the seller all day long, but if you're paying them cash at the close, go try and get your money when they didn't, uh, when the warranties turn out to be false or when they're the values that they said were there, aren't there, or they said there were no lawsuits, but there are. Okay. So the due diligence is essential. You cannot buy a business without it. And if you're buying a piece of real estate, a lot of that due diligence falls on the title company. You don't have that in a business. So in a business, you got to check out everything for yourself, period. But it's all tech checkable. Businesses are sold and bought every day and they're done where there's a due diligence process. There are services that help you with all that and that you've got to be able to go the distance. Now, when we do deals, we're really good at negotiating with everybody it takes to get this business purchased from everybody that normally gets paid like attorneys and accountants and appraisers. And we make deals with them because we do a lot of the work that they would do previously like this. We give them a complete roadmap, bringing down their costs of what they have to do to confirm or validate everything. And in the case of me, I write a lot of the agreements. I write the LOI, so we don't need an attorney for that. So by the time we bring the attorney into the deal, the closing's only two weeks away, four weeks away, and we're just going to finalize a definitive agreement, make sure it passes all the legal wording correctly for today's rules, whatever it is. So they don't have that much work to do, and they're very close to when the deal is going to close. I make a deal to pay them a very small amount of money just as a stipend. So they actually do get paid a little something for working on it, but their money comes from the closing. And they'll earn a little more that way because they're deferring their bill to a time when it wouldn't get paid anyway. An average agreement, you have the attorney do the work during the month. At the end of the month, 
if he's, if he has a good bookkeeping department, they actually send you the bill. If you don't have a good booking department, a whole month more will go by before they actually send you the bill. And then when they send you the bill, the, most attorneys will tell you that their average client doesn't pay him for 30 to 60, in some cases, 90 days, the bigger the company, the longer it takes to pay their attorney. So you're going to be paying your attorney, if you did it the way I just said, before their average client. So there's no reason for them not to make a deal with you to go along in order to be the attorney. They know they're going to have a certain amount of money that they get no matter, and maybe that wasn't going to make them happy. But the fact that they get paid more out of the closing does make them happy. And I always tell an attorney, look, if you lose money on me on this deal, I'll make it up on the name. So there's ways to make these folks happy and to keep your front end costs down. We're way over the hour as we speak here. So hopefully this session today was helpful and um, that you learned a lot about AI and what it can do for you, its strengths and its weaknesses. Uh, you've learned how to create a, a, a template tool for yourself. So if you find yourself doing repetitive information gathering, I suggest that you make it a template just like this one so that as you have to repeat this process over and over again, you have a template, you just drop it in there and boom, very quickly, you get the major answers to your questions, taking a lot of workload and time off your shoulders, and it makes you way more effective and way more efficient. I would like to thank you all for your enthusiastic presence here today. And I would like to just wish all of you the best of success. And I look forward to seeing you on the next one of these webinars that we do. And until then, I wish you the best of success.